Welcome to the Damcasters. I'm your host, Matt Bone. In the world of modern AV geekery, very few aircraft capture the imagination of the aviation fan like the Rockwell B-1B Lancer. As an aircraft, it is a stunning piece of design, but its story is also equally fascinating. With its roots in the super bombers of the 50s, the B-1 would see its way through multiple presidents, cancellation, and eventually service in wars it was never designed to fight. Today, I'm joined by Air Force veteran and career aerospace engineer, Kenneth P. Katz, who's the author of the new book, The Supersonic Bone, a development and operational history of the B-1 bomber. Ken and I delve deep into the history of this aircraft, so much so that this is actually going to be a two-part episode. In part one, we look at the genesis of the design through to its original cancellation in the Carter administration. In part two, we will look at the aircraft's Reagan-era rebirth, its entry into service, and its combat during the War on Terror. With so many facets to this aircraft and its history, I started off by asking Ken, how did he approach writing the history of the B-1? The B-1 is a fascinating story. And as I got into researching it, it's an airplane that all aviation buffs love. At least I've never met one that doesn't love it. It's everything that we like about airplanes. And sometimes people would dismiss things as I learned them. Oh, that's just politics. And I always thought that was kind of a silly way to look at things because the B-1 is a creature of politics. Without politics, we wouldn't have the Cold War. We wouldn't have the B-1. We wouldn't have the U.S. Air Force. So politics and, and, and all those other things are as much a part of this as the, the airplane stuff that we airplane fans love. I've sometimes described my book as it's a book for fanboys, but it's not a fanboy book. I think I'm definitely falling into the fanboy category on the B-1 because you're quite right. It's... It is as a special, special thing, just even just from an aesthetic perspective. But as you delve into the book, that the the story of how it came to be is, as you've quite rightly said, a political one as much as it is a technological one. Absolutely, it's a beautiful airplane, oh, but yeah. but we can't get caught up in a beautiful airplane because the kinds of people who make decisions don't care about airplanes or beautiful airplanes. We as Americans, and this is an American airplane, most Americans don't care about airplanes. What they care about is having some level of national security without uh, bankrupting the country. And to, to those people that they elect political leaders who in turn appoint secretaries of defense and other officials to make that happen. And none of those people are, or for that matter, are supposed to be airplane fans. The B-1 to them is just a tool. It's a means to an end. And if we want to understand the B-1 story as it actually is, then you have to understand the B-1 as a tool for national security, not just a beautiful airplane, although of course it is a beautiful airplane. And I think you, you explain that really well as you go through the book. But the, the other theme that you, you've mentioned in, in our notes as well, which I, I really liked as well, was the stories of the people involved in it all the way through. And I did like that there's quite a bit in there as well about the aircraft maintainers as well, what we'd call the irks over here, the, the, the men and women who keep the things flying. And I think that sort of full 360 degree look at the aircraft is really, really interesting. It gives it a lot more depth to see how an aircraft that's been in service for as long as it has, has been able to stay in service because of the, the changes that has been applied to it. An airplane can't have a soul. An airplane is just aluminum and titanium and fasteners and, and electronic bits and pieces. But an airplane can have a soul through the people who contribute to it. And those people, we always think about the people who fly the airplane, and they, of course, play a critical role in it. But there are many other people. They're the people who maintain it, and the B-1 in particular has always been a very maintenance-intensive aircraft. We have the people who designed it. We have the people who tested it. We have people who played many other roles. We have the policymakers, and 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 those people have to be talked about if you actually want to understand the B one story. Otherwise, it's just an inanimate object that sits there. 
hundred percent. But let's get into it because this story doesn't start with the aircraft in in the seventies. It starts way before that with the B fifty two entering service and the conversations around what was going to come next. And the question there is, what is the U.S. Air Force and what is SAC in particular, the Strategic Air Command, looking for in that next generation of their strategic defense? Well, let's go back to 1954, which is when the B-1 story starts. In 1954, the, the mainstays of the Strategic Air Command were the B-47, which was a medium jet-powered bomber, and the B-36, which was a reciprocating or propeller powered heavy bomber. What the Air Force really wanted was to have the intercontinental range of the B-36 with the jet performance of the B-47, and that airplane was the B-52. Now in 1954, the first um, of the production B-52s were just starting to be manufactured. So the airplane wasn't even in service yet with the Air Force. In fact, hadn't even been delivered other than as flight test aircraft to the Air Force. But this was an era of tremendous technological advance in aviation year over year. Remember 10 years before, the heavy bombers of the US Air Force were the B-17, the B-24, and, and just entering service, the B-29. So the Air Force was already starting to think about what would come after the B-52, even though the B-52 hadn't entered service yet. And this was also an era where higher and faster was just intuitively obvious the direction to be headed. So if the B-52, which was a high subsonic, high altitude bomber, was what was coming online in the next few years, then what would follow the B-52 had to be higher flying yet and faster yet and faster meant supersonic and yet this was a this was a a very ambitious move because remember that in the in 1954 mach 2 flight was a very new thing and it was really only being done by rocket powered x planes out of edwards air force base mach 3 flight hadn't even been achieved at least by by manned aircraft it, there had been some missiles that had achieved mach 3 flight but but already the air force was thinking about mach 2 and faster bombers and in 1954 sac put out a requirement for a supersonic bomber and the air research and development command started to work on it and and that really is the is the genesis not of the b1 but of what would eventually become the b1 and the aircraft that starts bridging that goes from reasonably rudimentary with things like the the b58 hustler which is a very strange aircraft at the best of times not terribly loved but then you get to possibly my favorite aircraft of all time outside of the Hawker Typhoon, of course, is the B-70 Valkyrie, which is that Mark III super bomber, for want of a better expression. Because That's a very accurate description of it. it. It's wonderful madness, I think, is the only way you can describe the, the Valkyrie, isn't it? It's. I love that description of wonderful madness, because I think that's, that's spot on. The B-58 Hustler was a, a smaller airplane. It was a medium bomber. And uh, the Air Force pursued that. It, it's, it's somewhat tangential to our story, but it was the first US Air Force supersonic bomber. Um, it had a very short service life. It only really was in service between about 1960 and 1970 and had a whole raft of problems associated with. But it is a beautiful airplane. Um, the first heavy bomber, which is to say a bomber with intercontinental range that the Air Force was going to have, sprung out of this 1954 requirement. It was called, it was originally designated as Weapon System 110A. And um, it was a Mach 3 plus bomber. There was a, a competition both for the engines and for the airframe. It ended up uh, being a competition between the Boeing Company and North American Aviation. North American Aviation won with their design, which became the B-70 Valkyrie. The engine uh, was a uh, General Electric afterburning turbojet called the J-93. 
and the B-70 had six of those engines. The B-70 was an incredible airplane. It was 600,000 pounds, which is huge. I mean, by comparison, um, the earlier models of the B-52 were about 450,000 pounds, and in the later models, you go up to 488,000 pounds. So it was a huge airplane. So it's 50% it, heavier than a, a fully... fully not better. quite, but, 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 but considerably heavier. It was, um, it was Mach 3 Plus. It had this very exotic uh, shape. Um, remember that at Mach 3, you can't build an airplane out of aluminum anymore. Aluminum can't handle the heat that's generated by, by Mach 3 flight. So it was built out of steel honeycomb. The reason why it wasn't built out of titanium is not is that there wasn't enough titanium around to build a fleet of 600,000 pound airplanes. Everything about the airplane was subordinated to speed and altitude. And, and that was a real problem because the B-70, and, and in the end, only two B-70s were built. They were the XB-70As, uh, which were flight test aircraft. They had no operational capability at all. The B-70 was, to be frank, a train wreck. Uh, everything you're, you're was spoiling my dreams now here, Ken. I, yes, I know it's every, a happy story, but my apologies. <laughs> everything was subordinated to speed and altitude. And as a result, the airplane had problems with every system. It's exotic new um, uh, stainless steel structure tended to leak in the fuel tanks. So they kept the fuel tanks pressurized and uh, that they had trouble keeping that sealed. All the systems on the airplane just about were problematic at one time or another, um, and they almost lost the airplane several times. The stainless steel structure tended to shed pieces in flight. That's not considered a desirable characteristic of an airplane. It certainly could go high and fast, but it just wasn't a practical airplane. Aside from its deficiencies as a, as a machine, it had several other problems. The first is that High and fast was not the way to go to penetrate Soviet airspace. In fact, the, the correct and most effective way to penetrate Soviet airspace in wartime was to go low because Soviet air defenses could pick you up if you were going high and you could generally shoot a missile higher and faster than you could fly an airplane. But if you went low, you could use terrain masking the airplane kind of blended into the terrain, it was very difficult to pick up with radars. So it was just conceptually the wrong airplane. It also had very bad timing because at the same time that the B-70 was being developed, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarine launch ballistic missiles were being developed. Remember, this was a time of uh, a very rapid strategic buildup in the United States. And so we were moving forward on multiple directions and to, to try to shore up our deterrent force. And the question started to be asked, do we really need bombers anymore? After all, we've got intercontinental ballistic missiles. You can't shoot down an intercontinental ballistic missile, or at least you couldn't back then. Why do we even need a bomber at all? It's a pretty good question. I mean, to, to bomber advocates, it's self-evident that, oh, we always need the newer and better bomber. But as I said, remember that national policy isn't made by airplane fans and shouldn't be made by airplane fans. They just want to defend the country. And, and why do we need a bomber? So you put all those together and it was very clear that the B-70 was the wrong airplane and perhaps no airplane at all was needed. And so the B-70... Um, which was intended to be the replacement for the B-52, um, became relegated to use as a research project. And, and really, it spent most of its life not as the prototype for a bomber, but as a research project supporting things like the supersonic transport. And one of the legacies of the B-70 program was that it led to the cancellation, I think you could say, of the B-70 project, because it was clear that the sonic booms that an airplane like the B-70 produced were just unacceptable for overland flight. So it's a fascinating part of the story that leads to the B-1, but it's also a, a tangent because uh, it was very clear that the B-70 was not the airplane that, that the Air Force needed as a bomber, if the Air Force needed a bomber at all. So 
the Air Force and its contractors started to study airplanes after the B-70. Now we're talking about the early 1960s. And it was very clear that a bomber needed to go low. And, and so future efforts were focused. Yes, the airplane would have a high altitude capability. And yes, it would probably be able to go fast, although not, not Mach 3 fast. But the real emphasis would be on, on very low altitude performance. So you need to be able to go fast. You need to have an airplane that's fairly efficient at low altitude. You need to have structures that can handle the buffeting of low altitude flight. You need to have terrain following radar. You also had a question of, do we need a bomber at all? And a strategic doctrine came about called the triad. Triad is three. And so the triad had three legs. It had manned bombers, it had intercontinental ballistic missiles, and it had submarine launch ballistic missiles. The triad concept served a lot of purposes. For one thing, if you looked at the advantages and disadvantages of each leg of the triad, um, they nicely complemented each other. Now, obviously there's a lot of redundancy there, but there's also some degree of advantages for one compensate for disadvantages of the other. And when your mission is to deter thermonuclear warfare and presumably all the horrible things that would lead from that, some degree of redundancy is probably not a bad thing. Um, it's, it's a wise use of funds. The triad also served institutional needs and the military services and the industries that support them are institutions with interests. So the triad doctrine kept the Air Force in manned bombers. The last thing that strate strategic air command was run by bomber generals, people who had cut their teeth flying bombers in World War II, and they had an enormous connection to flying bombers. The strategic air command didn't want to have all of its officers sitting in missile silos. That wasn't part of its institutional self-identity. They would have that, but they didn't want to be exclusively that. So the triad provided a rationale for, for strategic air command retaining bombers. Through the submarine launch ballistic missile part of triad, uh, it also gave the Navy a piece of the action. So uh, we had a very secure strategic deterrent in the United States, which was good. We had uh, everybody got a piece of the action. The strategic air command uh, kept manned bombers and the taxpayers had to spend a lot of money. But when you're deterring nuclear war, that's a reasonable use of money. So it turned out in the early 1960s that yes, the United States wanted to have a new bomber to replace the B-52 and that, un then that no, that bomber would not be the B-70. It would be an airplane focused on low altitude flight, although probably having a supersonic capability. Another one of the things that came out of those studies in the early 1960s was that if you were going to have a bomber that had some supersonic capability, and that was something that was decided that we did want to have, in addition to the primary low altitude, we didn't want to go Mach 3. Because when you go to Mach 3, you start to have to use exotic materials. And you can't build the airplane out of aluminum anymore. It's just too hot. Aluminum's a beautiful material. I mean, aluminum is inexpensive. Aluminum is easy to machine. It's easy to form. Once you say we can't use aluminum in an airplane, you start getting a, a, a monstrosity like the B-70. So what you see here is we're going to have an airplane that can fly low and fast. We're going to have an airplane that can fly high and fast, but not Mach 3 fast, Mach 2 fast. So we can build out of aluminum and you start to see the outlines of the B-1 come together. And through all of those elements, you have what becomes quite a modern mission profile, isn't it? It's, it's that sort of sp sprint into target, drop down to altitude, do its job, and then if possible, get out again. And it's one that you sort of see in multiple aircraft that are coming along at the time, thinking, yeah, F-111, what would become Tornado a bit later. And of course, the Russians are having the same ideas with at Sukhoi as well. With you, you do have this generation of aircraft that all start using this. And even within the RAF's uh, capabilities, you see Vulcan and things like that dropping down to, to low level as well. Something it's right. And story. you said Sukhoi, but you also have Tupolev. Yes. With the backfire. Mm. Best 
flight and landing I've ever had in an airplane was in a Tupolev 154. It was just the most comfortable thing ever. I was the only person on it. That, that's something else. We won't be talking about the Russians in any other role than, than them as potential adversary. But as, this, as they start to define that specification for what we'll call the B1A, as it's the first B1, the main thing that always stands out to everyone is the variable geometry wing on it, the swing wing. How does the specification lead directly to that interesting feature that we see on a very few aircraft coming through in the, the 60s and 70s? Let's, let's, let's answer your question in a, in a long and roundabout way. <laughs> It was a long and roundabout question, so it's the only way to answer it, really. We'll start with the Wright brothers. In the Wright brothers, everything on their airplane is fixed because the Wright flyer pretty much took off, cruised, and landed at the same airspeed. And so its design was optimized for that airspeed. But as airplanes get a larger and larger flight envelope, you start wanting to make things variable. So one of the first variable things you get is flaps. People think about variable geometry wings as swing wings, but an airplane with flaps has a variable geometry wing. An airplane, other things that become variable, you have retractable landing gear. That's a variable geometry aspect of airplanes. You get constant speed and variable pitch propellers. Once you move to jet engines, you start getting jet engines that have features like variable incidence compressor guide vanes. So if you can vary the geometry of the airplane, then um, you get a larger and larger flight envelope. And, and the logical endpoint of that is variable sweep wings, because wings that are swept forward tend to have better lift performance at low speed, so takeoff and landing, and they also have a more efficient cruise. Wings that swept back have much lower wave drag when you're flying at supersonic speeds. So if you're talking about an airplane like what the B-1 would become, and the B-1 before it was the B-1 was called the AMSA, or the Advanced Manned Strategic Aircraft, you want to have an airplane that can take off and land at what I'll call normal speed, so it can use normal runways. You want to have an airplane that can have an efficient long range cruise because it has to fly intercontinentally. And then you want to have an airplane that can, if need be, fly at Mach 2. So um, that, that implies a, 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 to do that optimally requires a, a range of wing sweep angles. And so you end up with uh, variable sweep wings. Now that technology had been in work since the 1950s. And the first iterations of that, uh, the first iteration was the X-5, which was an experimental aircraft that was tested in the 1950s and wasn't very successful. But there were various advances that came out of uh, both uh, the UK, Barnes Wallace, and out of NASA Langley Research Center that improved that. And the first production airplane that got the variable um, sweep wing was the F-111. And it, for a while, was the, uh, it was a, a very popular technology for military aircraft. Besides the F-111, of course, you have the F-14 Tomcat. You have the B-1. In Europe, Dassault worked on that, although they never uh, sold a Mirage that actually had it operationally. You have the Tornado, of course. And then you have a wide range of Soviet combat aircraft that had the variable sweep wing. So it was a very appealing technology, and uh, the B-1 just fits into the mainstream there. We're just going to take a short break for a quick message from our friends. Hello, folks. I'm Zach White, chair of the Napoleonic and Revolutionary War Graves charity. We're a new organization that honors the veterans of the period 1775 to 1815. What many don't realize is that those who died in conflicts before 1900 are not covered by war graves commissions, meaning that many veterans' graves are lying in disrepair. But the problem is more serious than that, because plenty of veterans' bodies are being excavated, but nobody is burying them. Instead, these war heroes' bodies are lying in cardboard boxes, their sacrifice forgotten. At the NRWGC, 
we're changing that, restoring graves and giving these veterans the dignity of a proper burial. So if you feel that the war dead deserve this basic respect, take a look at our website, www.nrwgc.com to find out more about our aims, how you can donate and the perks of being a member. Thank you. And we're back with Kenneth Katz and our discussion about the B-1B Lancer. Just to get us right into the aircraft itself, who are bidding for the, the AMSA contract at the moment? Because it's that in itself is quite interesting because we actually see the disappearance of one of the most famous names in aviation as it gets subsumed along the way. Right. Okay, so there are three companies that are competing for them. And if you will, it's America's A-team for bombers. The first company was General Dynamics. Uh, General Dynamics, of course, goes back to Consolidated and Convair. So in that bloodline, you have the B-24 Liberator, you have the B-36, and you have the B-58, as well as, of course, the F-111. You see a lot of... Uh, a lot of similarities between the B-1 and the F-111. Airplanes of similar performance. Of course, the B-1 is much bigger, but uh, they both have that variable sweep wing. So that's the first company that's competing. The second company that's competing is the Boeing company. The Boeing company in that bloodline, you have the B-17, you have the B-29, you have the B-50, which was really an advanced B-29. You have the B-47 and you have the B-52. And the third company that you have is North American Aviation. North American Aviation um, is a company whose uh, bomber chops, if you will, come from the B-25 Mitchell, the B-45 Tornado, which was the first American operational jet bomber, and the B-70. Um, of course, uh, you have a lot of famous fighters that come out of North American aviation also. North American aviation uh, went through a variety of corporate changes. Um, it was uh, acquired by uh, Rockwell and became North American Rockwell and eventually would be renamed Rockwell International. But uh, that's the, you know, that, that bloodline, if you will, goes back to the North American aviation of uh, the 1930s and 40s and 50s, which is, of course, a very famous company. Big fan of the B-25 as well, but that's another show as well. Now, you also have two companies competing for the engines. Um, you have Pratt & Whitney and General Electric. But you've really got the great and the good of US aviation all bidding for this this contract at the time. It's It's... The Cadillac contract, really, isn't it? It's, it's well, it's it's one of several. You also have the F-15 contract going on at the same time, <laughs> and um, that was a the, these that was a, another major contract. Um, the, the same two engine companies, some of the same and some different airframe companies, and at the time, business was getting a little bit scarce. And so there was a, uh, remember that uh, these companies were also very involved in the space program and the Apollo program was spooling down at this time as we get into the 19, as into the late 1960s. So um, all these companies were very hungry for the business. I believe that one of the reasons why the um, airplane has General Electric engines, and of course the B-1 has General Electric engines, and this is no slap against the, the airplane's engines, which, uh, which have proven to be excellent for many decades. But Pratt & Whitney won the contract for the engine on the F-15. That made sense that General Electric would get the contract for the B-1, and they both were competing for both of those contracts because the military doesn't want to be in a situation where they give all their business to one company and then the other companies go out of business. The next time you want to have a jet engine, you don't have any choice. So also, there's simply a limited amount of industrial and, and human resources. So it does make sense to keep them employed. And you're talking about what are in general highly competent companies. So uh, it's not surprising that Pratt & Whitney, if Pratt & Whitney gets the engine for one, that General Electric would get the engine for the other. And it's also palatable politically as well as you're able That's to right. sp That's spread right. workload across the country. Yeah. That's right. So, cuts to the chase, North American Rockwell get the gig. What is the aircraft that wins the contract that becomes the B-1? 
the airplane's a big airplane. It's uh, 395,000 pounds, but that's not a huge airplane. That's actually a little lighter than the B-1. It's a very streamlined airplane. It's very much a Mach 2 airplane. When, when its wings are swept back, it looks like it's going Mach 2 on the ground. Well, actually, it can't have its wings swung back on the ground or it would tip back on its tail, but you get my point. It's a very <laughs> streamlined airplane. It's an airplane that can um, sweep its wings forward for cruise and for takeoff and landing. But even though it can go Mach 2, and a lot of its airframe is shaped around Mach 2, you can see the uh, what's called the area rule um, in how its fuselage is formed to minimize wave drag, where it, its sweet spot is not Mach 2. Its sweet spot is going at very low altitude at about Mach 0.9, and it can do that for thousands of miles. That's a real trick because jet engines typically guzzle fuel at that altitude. And so having an airplane that can have a range of a few thousand miles at low altitude is quite a trick. Now, in order to fly at low altitude, it has a terrain following radar, so it can, and, and a very sophisticated inter, integrated navigation system, so it can do that low altitude flight in any weather, day or night. Um, it has engines and airframe that are optimized for that. It, remember, you have a long, thin airplane. It has to be long and thin because you want to minimize wave drag at these high speeds. There are a couple of things that come out of that, one of which is that the airplane, the airframe is inherently going to flex somewhat because it's long and thin. So you have what's called a structural mode control system, little fins in the front. And what they do is take out the, um, the, the, the bending of the airframe in... Um, in low altitude flight. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, example of feedback control system. The airplane is, is somewhat uh, inherently unstable and therefore it has a very sophisticated uh, flight control system to keep the airplane pointed in the right direction. It's a fly-by-wire system, although interestingly not a digital fly-by-wire system like a modern airplane would have. It's an analog fly-by-wire system, but a very sophisticated one. The airplane also has a very interesting fuel management and, and a fuel and a center of gravity management system because when you've got a tremendous amount of fuel strung out over this long fuselage, if you have too much of the fuel forward or aft, you're going to have an airplane that uh, is uh, unbalanced. So it, you would really need a, f a flight engineer if you didn't have this computerized system that keeps the fuel in the right place. So an awful lot of requirements and, and, and systems capabilities come out of this need to fly low and fast. The airplane also has, in order to penetrate Soviet air defenses, part one of that is its ability to fly low and fast. Part two of that is that the airplane is going to be equipped with the world's most sophisticated electronic countermeasure system. That comes out of a company called AIL on Long Island in the United States. The fuel aspect plays straight into as well. If, if the fuselage is flexing, you're not going to want it to be out of trim fuel-wise because that's just going to exacerbate that flexing, which is which is fascinating, getting terribly geeky. The, the other aspect besides the swing wing on it is it was one of these aircraft originally designed with an escape capsule for the, the cockpit and the crew. So the airplane had an ejection capsule. Normally... The, the the means of egress in a high-performance combat aircraft is an ejection seat. So each crew member sits in an ejection seat, and if things go south, they eject out. The F-111 sets a lot of precedent for the B-1. It's not that it's a direct predecessor, but certainly they both were used by the same military service, and the concepts for one bled into the other. The F-111 had an ejection capsule. There's a lot of attractions to an ejection capsule. One, so in other words, the whole cockpit separate blasts off instead of individuals being in, in seats. One of the advantages is that if you're flying at supersonic speeds, above about 400 knots, if you eject, you have a very good chance of being injured or killed. And so when you eject the whole cockpit, the, the people who are being ejected don't all of a sudden have their bodies subjected to very high speed airflow, which can injure or kill them. So that's the, the first and obvious advantage of an ejection capsule. But there are several other advantages. If you're going to eject over the water, 
And after you eject your one person splashing around in the water with your life vest, um, you, it's going to be very hard to find you. If you eject in a capsule, you have a ready-made life raft. It's going to be not only are you more likely that you know you actually are going to be in this in this raft, although probably not very seaworthy. I would suspect that um, that would be a very uncomfortable ride. But nonetheless, um, you're more likely to be found. There's a there's an additional advantage too, although the basic crew of a B1 is four, it was designed to carry up to six people. Now you have four crew members in the B1. If you have a pilot in the front left and a co-pilot in the front right. In the back, you have what's called an OSO or, or offensive systems operator. That's a navigator um, who is focused on navigation and weapons delivery. And then you have what's called a DSO or defensive systems operator. That's the person who's operating the electronic countermeasure system. In the U.S. Air Force, that person would be a rated navigator. In the RAF, that person would be called an air electronics officer. Mm. So it's not a flight engineer. It's a defensive systems operator. So you could have an instructor pilot who would sit on a jump seat between the pilots and then an instructor systems operator in the back who would uh, sit between the offensive systems operator and the defensive systems operator. Those people in, normally wouldn't have ejection seats. In a B-52, those people don't have ejection seats. So if you have an airplane without ejection seats, then you have some crew members who have a lesser probability of surviving a, an ejection because they have to manually bail out with parachutes. So with an ejection capsule, you don't have that problem anymore. So an ejection capsule seemed like a really cool feature to put on the B-1. And in fact, you'll see it on the first three B-1A prototypes. Nonetheless, it got dropped. In fact, it got dropped even when we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves with the story, but the production B-1, had it gone into service, and of course we'll talk about it didn't go into service, but had would, would have reverted, if you will, to ejection seats. It would not have had an ejection capsule. An ejection capsule had a bunch of problems. The first thing, it's, it's essentially another aircraft. So now you have to design an aircraft that fits on another aircraft. So it's a very expensive, complex thing. Furthermore, the sequence by which a ejection capsule severs all the connections to the airplane, rockets away from the airplane, and then all these parachutes and airbags and things come out. There's something like a thousand things that have to happen for this ejection to happen. So from a reliability point of view, um, an awful lot of things have to work right. And in, in the one case where it was used on one of the prototype B1s, a crew member was killed because everything did not work quite right. The, because it, the, 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 the more thing, the more things in the chain, the more chances that one of those things can exactly. go wrong. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and in most cases you don't have redundancy. So any single point failure uh, will have catastrophic consequences. If you have a very complicated device and everything has to work just perfectly, you probably have to have a lot of maintenance. So this ejection capsule was going to drive maintenance requirements and it got worse than that. The ejection capsule is not a little thing. It's, it's really the cockpit of the aircraft. It's, a part of, it's an integral part of the structure. So in order to remove the ejection capsule to periodically maintain it, you can't just lift it out of the airplane. The airplane would fold up on itself. It would collapse. So you have to support the whole airplane. It's a, it would, every time you wanted to maintain it, it was a, or at least undergo a major overhaul. It was a major engineering project. In addition to that, the ejection capsule had a lot of advantages for very high speed ejections. But the B-1 was optimized for low altitude flight. And at low altitude flight, you have a, a larger ejection, safe ejection envelope with ejection seats and with this ejection capsule. So it was an interesting idea. Um, it was built into the first three B-1A prototypes, but it would not have been in the production aircraft and, and was not in the B-1B that was eventually fielded. So for the B-1, we have four aircraft that are built. What are the initial findings of the aircraft once once they get it into the air? What, what are the crews reporting back? The B-1 full-scale development started in 1970. The first B-1A 
flu in 1974 at the end of the year. Um, it was followed uh, later by B1A number two and B1A number three. It was a good airplane. I mean, any new airplane is going to have problems, but uh, the B1 did not have a lot of major problems. It flew well. It, it was clearly going to be an effective airplane. It, it was a, a very well-regarded airplane. And, and I think that in contrast to the B-70, it was a good airplane because it, uh, first of all, it was well-conceived. The, 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 the airplane that was designed and the operational requirements uh, meshed well. It was a good airplane because it was advanced and ambitious, but not too advanced and too ambitious, unlike the B-70, which was simply... Um, far too ambitious and, 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 and paid the price. The B-1 was a well-balanced airplane. It balanced off reliability, maintainability, avionics capability, performance. It wasn't the ultimate in any one regard, but across the range of capabilities, it was quite good. It also was an airplane that I think uh, benefited from um, advances in, particularly in electronics technology. Um, one of the things that, that sunk the B-58 Hustler, for example, was that the airplane had tremendously advanced electronics, but uh, they were all analog electronics, and uh, it was just ahead of its time. It was very unreliable. By the time the B-1 came around in the early 1970s, digital electronics had advanced greatly. And so you had a, a true digital airplane. And that paid uh, off normal ben enormous benefits in terms of operational capability and reliability. So we have a very good aircraft, one that's going through its test program well. And again, we have to come back to politics because it's arriving at a very difficult time for you know the world as a whole. But within the United States as well, you have a lot of change at the top, I think. So probably a polite way to discuss the Nixon, Ford and, and Carter years. But what else is happening that is making a bomber seem unpalatable to the, the politicals at the top? The B-1 suffered from bad timing. You're talking about an airplane that's under development in the early 1970s. Now, let's put this in context. These are the ending years of America's involvement in the Vietnam War, which is was a from purely from a domestic political point of view, was a highly destructive and divisive conflict. We came out of this, uh, and we were coming out of this war in the uh, early, mid-1970s. And so you had, uh, a, in general, there was not much support for the military. There was a belief that the pursuit of the Cold War had gotten us into this messy and unnecessary and divisive war. And there was also belief that uh, perhaps we could reach an arrangement with the Soviet Union and that whereas previously we had been focusing on deterrence through a very strong military and confrontation, again, that's the kind of thing that got us into the Vietnam War, that now we ought to try a new policy of detente, of signing arms control treaties. And if you're in this political environment, the most high visibility military expenditure was the B-1. I mean, the B-1 sort of symbolized a traditional confrontational approach towards the Soviet Union. And so um, it became a very controversial weapon system as a result. Do we really need, as opponents of the B-1 would say, do we need additional nuclear overkill? We can already destroy the Soviet Union several times over. At least that was the, the claim. Why do we need to do it even more? So one strike against the B-1 may have intrinsically been a very capable weapon system, but there was a broader political question. Do we need this capable weapon system at all? There was another problem that the B-1 had, which is that an alternative had come up out of left field. Cruise missiles had been around for a long time. Of course, the most famous of those was the German V-1 in World War II. The United States had fielded various cruise missiles uh, in the Cold War in the 1950s and 1960s. They weren't particularly effective weapon systems. The jet engines were inefficient. The electronics weren't very good. The nuclear weapons were rather large. And so as a result, 
um, they weren't very effective uh, weapon systems. But a new generation of cruise missiles had arrived. Um, they had much more efficient one-use turbofan jet engines. They had much smaller miniaturized nuclear warheads. And just as on the B-1, you finally had um, highly reliable and accurate electronic navigation systems. So you could build a small yet highly effective long-range nuclear-armed cruise missile. And people started to ask the question, if I can build a bunch of cruise missiles and I can put them on my B-52, and so instead of having to shoot down one bomber, you have to shoot down, let's say, a dozen cruise missiles, and the bomber itself doesn't have to penetrate enemy air defenses, why do I need to build a B-1 at all? This is, this is an alternative that, let's say, would cost half as much and might be just as effective. Now, remember that the B-1 or any bomber is part of a triad. It's not all of America's strategic deterrence. It's one leg of three. And to some extent, a bomber is a redundant backup to the other legs. So it isn't even a question of is the B-1 as effective as a B-52 carrying uh, that's been retrofitted to carry cruise missiles. It's, is it good enough at half the cost? And so in 1977, President Carter, who had run against the B-1, had to make a decision as to whether we were going to, we meaning the United States, were going to go ahead with the B-1 or not. And he weighed the pros and cons. And he decided that he was going to um, have a program that consisted of rearming the B-52 with cruise missiles and that the B-1 was going to be canceled as a production program. Now, when I say that President Carter did this, of course, in a constitutional republic like the United States, presidents don't unilaterally do these things. He advocates a policy and then, of course, it has to go through Congress. Now, as a result, he did prevail and the B-1 production was canceled. And instead, there was a new program to arm the B-52 with cruise missiles and to modify the B-52 with cruise missiles. But this wasn't the end of the B-1. First of all, testing of the B-1 continued at a reduced level. The official reason was that this was to maintain options for the future. Um, if you're somewhat cynical about politics, I think that this was also a bone to throw to the B-1 proponents so that they would have something. And it was, uh, it kept some people employed. It kept the airplane an option for the future. And so um, you could buy some votes from people who might've liked the B-1, but uh, didn't particularly want to defy the president of the United States. The second thing is, is that there had been three B-1As uh, under contract. These were going to be, if you will, the prototypes for the production, not, not prototypes. They were going to be the pre-production aircraft. And um, two of those were canceled, but B-1A number four would be continued. That would be the first airplane that would have the elaborate electronic countermeasure system. So it would add much to the testing. The third thing is, is that parts of the B-1 survived. The B-1 offensive avionics system um, was being produced by Boeing. Even though Boeing didn't get the prime contract for the airplane, they did get the avionics system contract. And a derivative of that system would be refitted to the B-52 where it would be needed to, um, to uh, target and align and launch the cruise missiles. So in various ways, the B-1 survived its cancellation. That's the end of the story for the B-1A, but the B-1B will live on. And next week, Ken and I will be discussing how the aircraft returned during the Reagan administration and would serve right through till today and beyond. The Supersonic Bone, a development and operational history of the B-1 bomber by Kenneth P. Katz is available in the UK through Pen and Sword and in the States through Casemates. Of course, you can buy your copy here in the UK from the Boney Abroad Bookshop. There's a link in the description. 10% of every sale goes to supporting the pod and bookshop.org also will make donations to help the independent bookshops of the UK keep going. If you have enjoyed the podcast and would like to support us going forward, you can via Patreon. 
From just three pounds a month plus VAT, you'll get all of our episodes on a dedicated feed, ad free, and before they head out to the rest of the world. There's also a Discord server where you can chat to me about all things aviation related, what's coming up for the podcast, and ask questions for upcoming guests as well. You'll also get a hand scrolled thank you postcard from me, designed by aircraft.co.uk, to say, well, thanks. You can find our Patreon page in the link in the description below or at patreon.com forward slash the Damcasters, all one word. Thank you for your support, and until next time, do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone, and it is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.